So welcome everyone. I'm so happy to spend such a rainy, cold October Sunday with everyone. This is a wonderful use for it. Um, and I'm so thrilled to be able to introduce Michael Ryan, who is one of our five artists and our subject of today's chat. To give him a brief bio, uh, Mike Ryan is an Iowa native and has been a painter all his life. He was educated at the University of Iowa, Drake University, and Old Dominion University. Ryan turned to representational painting in the early 1980s after his early training in abstraction. He was influenced by the Bay Area painters of California, especially Wolf Kahn, uh, with their successful fusion of high key color and marriage of representational imagery with abstract forms, uh, which became the inspiration for a lot of his work. Mike Ryan teaches and mentors privately in Eastern Iowa and participates in exhibitions on a regular basis, obviously. Uh, and his work has been collected by many private and corporate clients. He lives, paints, and teaches in Cedar Rapids. Uh, so I will start this off the way I've started off all of these, um, which is just asking Mike to tell us a little bit about when you started making art. Well, <clears throat> first, let me thank everybody for joining us. Very nice of you to take some of your Sunday afternoon for me. Um, I'm quite proud to be in this uh, exhibit and uh, also be part of the uh, uh, permanent collection at the museum. Uh, it's quite an honor to uh, uh, represent uh, uh, the state of Iowa in this kind of an exhibit. So uh, as far as when I started making art, I can't remember when I didn't make art. I think when I was a little kid, my mother um, who had many more children to worry about than me, used to allow me to stay home sometimes and I'd draw on big rolls of butcher block paper that you know, I'd draw all these scenes. I'd draw all day long until the whole family room floor was, was covered with them. <clears throat> and I think she just allowed me to do that. I'm pretty sure she didn't believe I was sick. <laughs> like I told her she, I was. But I don't remember a time when uh, art wasn't important in uh, my family. Uh, my mother had uh, some training in it, and uh, we had connections uh, through the family with uh, Grant Wood, Marvin Cohn, people like that. Uh, so art was always sort of important. I can remember I still have some of my first efforts floating around in my one of my portfolios, and uh, it was uh, it was pretty bad, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> So I thought, uh, I thought I had to be trained a little bit. And so I went to Drake University and there was a uh, kind of a big uh, uh, a difficulty. My father wanted me to, be a, me to be a lawyer and I wanted to be a painter. And trust me, I'm a much better painter than I would have been a lawyer. <laughs> so I, I think I made the right choice in life. But uh, I started out painting uh, seriously in uh, kind of a, in a color field abstract manner and always wanted to um, uh, connect abstract and, and some kind of narrative like you see in, in uh, representational painting. I discovered uh, the California Bay Area painters uh, fairly early on in the early 80s and thought, well, they're getting close to what I wanted to do. So that uh, kind of developed from that. I, basically, I've been lucky enough to live long enough to do what I wanted to do in the first place. <laughs> so uh, in the past 25, 30 years, I have been very seriously painting. And uh, uh, finally, I think we're, I'm getting to a place where I might uh, start getting good at it. So that's kind of, that's kind of what uh, uh, my story is in a nutshell. Well, I think you're definitely at that place where you're good at it. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, when did you start creating landscape or tell us a little bit about what drew you to landscape as a genre? Well, as I said, I started out as an abstract painter and all my abstract paintings look vaguely like a landscape, to be honest with you. And uh, so uh, I think uh, I saw kind of endless possibilities in landscape. There was always something around the next corner that would catch your eye. And I thought, uh, I like having a story attached to the paintings. And I was having difficulty finding that narrative in abstract art. And so 
uh, moving to uh, landscape seemed like a natural segue to me. And uh, it, when I paint, there are just a few things that are really important to me. Uh, color, uh, brushwork, size, and the narrative. And so those four elements have to be present for me to be happy uh, with the painting. And so uh, since I, oh, I suppose in the last 40 years have done mostly landscape painting, uh, some figurative work and some, uh, some still life work. But the uh, thing I think about landscape painting uh, that intrigues me the most is that you never run out of ideas. You never run out of a subject, especially out here where we live. Uh, the sky changes every minute and the, uh, and the colors change every minute, so. That's a really good point. It is endless, <laughs> endless opportunities for inspiration. Do you have a favorite type of landscape scene to paint? Well, I, yeah, I, I love kind of looking at the edges of things and looking through trees, uh, looking through, looking down valleys, uh, finding little creeks with trees all around it, little, little pathways going through the painting. I'm always looking for a path through the painting to, um, to guide the eye. I use color and uh, form a lot to guide the eye as well. And so uh, when I start looking at a landscape, I start kind of dissembling it into a little more abstracted form. Uh, and uh, one, of, one of the things I think that makes my work, my work as opposed to copying anybody else's is that um, I have kind of flattened the images slightly and uh, have gotten a little more design element in there. And the, and the colors are um, qu quite uh, well thought out. I never put a color down unless I'm pretty sure it's gonna work with a color next to it, either enhancing it or, um, or uh, making it vibrate. And so when I look at color, it's to me, the emotion of the painting. So if you think about, if you think about paintings as, as music, paintings are basically jazz, right? And so the, um, <clears throat> the landscape would be the melody and all the brushwork and the, uh, and the color and everything else are the imp improvisation of a part of it. And uh, even though I, I plan my paintings rather, uh, uh, rather completely, you always have that at the end, you always have to have some of that inspirational uh, innovation to make them work. So am I, am I wandering off topic? Probably. No, that was perfect. <laughs> it, it was so vivid though. It inspired me. Let me bring up our image of some of your works, which I think will, okay. will help everyone see what you're talking about. If I can, there we go. <clears throat> well, in this painting, um, it's called a, a still November morning, I believe it is. And mm -hmm. what I uh, was intrigued about was the quietness of that scene. Uh, even though the colors actually vibrate quite a bit, the, uh, the scene itself is quiet. There's very little movement in the trees or anything else. And I wanted to convey that kind of stillness, that sense of place. And even though most of my landscapes now are not uh, done on site, so they're really an amalgamation of things I've seen over the years. Um, so the emotion of this particular painting is I wanted a quiet, rich painting. And I think that's what we end up with. Absolutely. Uh, and you touched on this a little bit. Um, but I wondered if you could kind of walk us through your, your process from inspiration to finished painting. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, everything I do is pretty deliberate. And so when I start uh, uh, thinking about a painting, I usually start out with, a, uh, with some small sketches, kind of rough sketches of what I had envisioned in in the painting. And then I kind of decide how big the painting should be. And if I could make them, you know, uh, as big as uh, 
Joan Mitchell's paintings, I would do that, but I can't get them around in my car, so they get some, they're not that big. At any rate, uh, so I start out with the with the sketches, and then I move uh, often to a small uh, study of part or some in, in, uh, something about the painting that intrigues me and uh, what I want to include, and that then creates an imaginary line really to the next step. The next step is taking the canvas and, and doing what is called a no tan. And no tan is a, uh, is a term for uh, deciding compositionally where your lights and darks are. Mm -hmm. And then you, uh, then you go from there into the underpainting. And uh, depending on the colors I'm using, that underpainting could, in fact, be uh, a rich brown, uh, 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 burnt sienna, or a bright orange, depending on what I'm, what I'm going to put over the top of it. And then when I'm painting it, then I'm, I'm perfectly open to happy accidents. Uh, hap, uh, I like uh, to be a little improvisational uh, uh, in my approach to the colors and the way it all goes together. But really, um, I'd have to say that they're pretty planned. And I use a lot of, um, I guess you could almost say it's like quilt making. There's a lot of elements that I kind of sew together uh, on these paintings. And so this, a good example of that would be the, as you're looking at that painting, would be the bottom uh, right. And if you notice all the uh, small streaks of color and, and, and form down there, that kind of gives your eye an opportunity to run into that painting, into that blue, and then slide up those yellows and slide back around through the sky. And then you see the barn back there, the, the structure. And then you see that kind of rich uh, uh, golden uh, orange uh, tree line right along the edge of the river. So again, I like rivers. I like the reflections. I like things that are, um, are a little more abstracted and so that's kind of how I how I plan them and execute them that's wonderful I know you've always made a lot of like music allusions to me about your work like about jazz which I could mm -hmm. definitely see is has a structure to it but definitely leaves room for improvisation exactly exactly I mean, if I knew more about classical music, I might relate it to somebody <laughs> in classical. <laughs> I know more about jazz. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's look at, where's my mouse? There we go. My, this is my favorite of yours in the exhibition. Well, thank you. Uh, that is called Ripe Corn Morning. And again, it's somewhat of an amalgamation of, of things I see. I'm an early riser, and so I see the sunrise a lot. And in early uh, October, especially, you see that the corn has not been picked yet. And it's just this rich gold color. And, uh, and I thought that it was pretty interesting to tie that rich gold color to a low sun and some of the uh, interesting sky features you see in the morning. And then have it reflected down at the bottom, the bottom third of the painting is the river and having all those things reflected back and forth. So I kind of want your eye to bounce through that. And I think the pink kind of guides you so through the sky and along the edge of the structure and then along the edge of the, of the uh, corn. And then you see the pink followed up in the, um, in the river. And so um, this one probably has more to do with being a tone poem, if you know what I mean. Um, it's a color poem more than anything else. I'm going to study in color and, and how it all goes together. Uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's interesting that it, it should hang together as well as it does, because in the upper left corner, you know, you've got those dark kind of areas and you have to, uh, travel all the way across the painting to the structure and then and back to the structure to get that dark again. And then uh, hopefully you, you come right along the edge of that corn and drop into another dark area. And that's so I tried to guide the eye through the painting using color 
and form. And again, that's all possible because you do the no tan first and you know where your lights and darks are gonna be. And so you, you operate from a uh, uh, kind of a principle of, of a plan brush work, I think would be, would be a good way to put it. And it leads you on these really nice, strong diagonals, which makes it feel really dynamic and lively. Well, there's nothing bo more boring than, uh, than uh, having no diagonals, having straight yeah. lines everywhere. <laughs> And so, yeah, it, it, the diagonals also help guide the eye through the thing. And mm -hmm. I think it's important to, um, I, to realize that when you're doing art, uh, often you only have a few seconds to catch someone's attention. It's kind of almost like a soup can label, label in a way, uh, because you have to have enough dynamics in the painting to get people to look for the second time. Mm -hmm. And it's the second time lookers who really kind of get into the painting. Uh, and so uh, you know, I'm always looking for a way to kind of uh, uh, create interest. And mm -hmm. so if you look at that diagonal of the corn going up through the, the, the area of the hillside there, and then right at the top, there's a big uh, yellow area that mm -hmm. reflects that corn color, but it's in among the trees. And so that, that allows your eye to pop, to jump up. And we are, after all, in a business that uh, relies on uh, people's perceptions and, and their interests. And so we have to grab their, grab their interest any way we can. Mm. That's what I do, so. That's perfect, I love this one. And our next uh, piece, Cascade. Very no, different. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say so different from ripe corn morning. Yeah. Well, it is and it isn't in, in a way. And the way it is, there is a place uh, called Morgan Creek Park that Judy and I walk at a bit. And one spring several years ago, before the derecho, we walked along this little stream, this Morgan Creek, and we saw on this hillside the most magnificent cascade of bluebells coming down the hillside, sticking into the low hollows. And, and I always wanted to paint that. And then the derecho happened and a lot of that's gone. And a lot of those trees are gone. And so I thought I'd paint that this last spring. And I called it Cascade for obvious reasons. But there again, you'll notice the blue guides your eye through the painting. Mm -hmm. And there's a little blue sky peeking through the kind of lace-like uh, uh, structures of the trees. And that, and that blue sky then bleeds down to the cascade and then the cascade bleeds into the river or mm -hmm. into the creek. And so there again, I'm doing the same thing I did with ripe corn morning. I'm just using a little different uh, kind of approach to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I love uh, the idea of horizontals and verticals. Mm -hmm. I think that makes your brain interested. And that's another way you capture the eye, you know, is making it, making it a little more dynamic that way. But this one's one of my favorite paints. I really like that paint. And we had a little better shot of it. We could, you could see the green and the different colors of the blues of the bluebells mm -hmm. but you know you only, you only do so much on a computer so yeah i well, would encourage you to go look, at, look at it in person yeah uh, i was and, really enjoying seeing the stripes through the trees in the background yeah I, that's kind of yeah uh, that's kind of the idea you know you want those horizontals and the verticals mm -hmm. interacting with each other and again that gets into the color theory you want to make sure that your colors are, are going to do that. Absolutely. You. So. Well, and I just wanted to double check. Did we, we kind of skipped over this one because we were talking about process, but is there anything uh, in particular we should come back to on still November morning? Well, the one, the one thing that uh, I always, I, I missed in abstract painting mm -hmm was that sense of place. And since I, uh, Judy and I have chosen to live out here in the 
in a, uh, an area that would sense a place is really important. And, and so that's kind of one of the, the motivations for moving the landscape. Also, I've, I've, I've always been quite intrigued with Japanese printmaking. Mm. And I love the way they structure their prints. And so, especially uh, uh, some of the older uh, guys from the 17th, 18th century, they really, um, they really knew how to present a, uh, a composition. So from compositionally, I look at that sort of thing. Also, oddly enough, Franz Klein, who is a, a famous abstract painter, uh, had a lot to do with my, uh, with my ideas of composition. Because he used blacks and whites in some color, but he used blacks and whites in very interesting ways. And I noticed that my paintings and his paints have the same sort of composition elements. So, uh, so all that sort of thing is present, you know, if you could squint mm -hmm. your eyes and make that painting kind of abstracted, it works pretty well that way too. So. Absolutely. It does. Wonderful. Well, I will open it up to questions now. Um, if anyone has things for Mike. Don't be shy. Um, I have one that has a couple that are actually from my daughter. She's slinging coffee right now at an establishment. Um, it's her first painting class in high school. And she thinks she knows a lot because she's been to the museum a lot. So <laughs> she she's intrigued by your color. She loves the color. And right now they are um, teaching her how to, you know, do color representing, you know, exactly. And she doesn't like that. <laughs> so she wants to know how you choose your colors, um, how you decide on them, if they're um, realistic or not, or how you put that all together. Well, I, uh, Gauguin reportedly said this to one of his group in Brittany one time was when he was painting there. And he said, well, if you're going to make it green, make it green. Um, I kind of agree with that. I don't know whether he actually really said that or not, but um, <laughs> as far as colors go, if she uh, takes a good look at the color wheel, which you can find online or anywhere else, you will notice, and this is what the Impressionists taught us too, uh, you'll notice that <clears throat> when you put colors from the opposite side of the color wheel next to each other, they tend to vibrate. They tend to have this interaction. And if you look at a Monet water lilies painting or any Monet painting, you'll see that same kind of vibration going on. And so if, you're, if you wanna be a colorist, you have to be very, very aware of what that color wheel is doing and what your paint, what your, what your paint marks are, are laying next to. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna do green, uh, kind of a, a spring green, it can be very effective. You lay a purple next to that. And if you look at the color wheel, they're directly across from each other in the color wheel. So if I, if I were going to advise her on that, I would say uh, uh, get your essentials of your, uh, of your painting class, but also take a look at that color wheel. And that'll give you uh, some options on, uh, on how, how to make color more intense. Thank you very much. That will be helpful. Then the second question she had was like, how you chose your medium? Because of course, right now they're working in all sorts of different ones. And I don't believe they've let them uh, work in oil, probably because of ventilation and things like that. Uh, but she wants good. to know how you chose that. Well, I use, I actually use water soluble oils, uh, largely because I don't, I'm not a big fan of turpentine and solvents. And uh, also it's much, much easier for cleanup and all that. I spent a lot of time in my life where I had to uh, pack up the stuff after I got done with it. So cleanup was important, but uh, um, it does, uh, water soluble oils does present a problem that it dries a little more matte than, uh, uh, so you have to have some attitudes to that to make it a little more juicy. Uh, but you know, uh, acrylic is so good now. Uh, there are so many options out there. Um, 
you could use acrylic, use watercolor, you could use a lot of things, wash, that uh, will give you the result you want, I think. I don't think the, I don't think the, basically, I don't think the materials that you use is quite as important as how well you use them. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Other questions? Mm -hmm. I have a question. Hi, Mike. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Um, I, I haven't seen your early, early work, but for the last 20 years or so, I've kind of watched the evolution of your work. And I wonder if you can talk about what you have learned and changed about how you use color. I may be imagining this, but it seems to me like your, your older work was more muted or subdued and this more recent work, the colors seem more vibrant? I think there's some truth to that. Um, the, uh, while I was always interested in color, I was kind of trapped in this idea that the colors ought to be uh, what you see outside. And we live in, a, in an atmosphere full of dust and, and uh, particles. And so we kind of live at four o'clock in the afternoon, color-wise. Uh, some of the California painters, for instance, as far as I can see, live at high noon all the time, and they're always more beautiful. So I think what uh, what I've tried to do over the years, surely, is to is to um, kind of push color a little bit more uh, and get over the idea that it has to look like it does outside. You know, I think uh, uh, it was a Hans Hoffman, an abstract painter, who was a great teacher. He used to take his people outside to plain air paint, and he'd always say things like, uh, you "Now, that's a landscape, and this is a painting, and they aren't the same thing. They aren't the same thing." And so I kind of believe that now. I, I've kind of come to that conclusion that. Paintings should look like paintings. They should be paintings and not worry so much about uh, uh, whether or not uh, people pick up and recognize exactly what you're doing or what you're presenting. Mm -hmm. It's more important to, to show the work of the, uh, the hand of the artist involved as opposed to uh, any kind of realism. But that's just my opinion. There are lots of people who do lots of other things that are certainly more talented than I am. So did that answer your question at all? It does, thank you. And I, I like um, the story of how you discovered that and how your work has evolved because of that. Yeah, very nice. Well, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of looking at other people's work and uh, starting with the historical painters, you know, the people that you know, we all study. Uh, then um, I also look at a lot of contemporary people uh, and some of, them, some of them are in this chat, as a matter of fact. And all of them give me ideas. And most of them uh, have, if they're good, they have something to tell you and you have something to learn from them. So that's, that's kind of my attitude with it. That's wonderful. Uh, we had a question in the chat, um, wondering what colors are on your painting palette? Well, I tend to, uh, well, literally I can tell you, I. I tend to uh, go towards a little more of the earth tones. Mm -hmm. uh, I like uh, uh, Naples yellow and the cadmiums and all three cadmium grades. Uh, I like uh, oranges and reds and that sort of thing. But I also like a lot of different kinds of blues. And so I use uh, cerulean, I use uh, cobalt, uh, I use uh, French ultramarine blues. Sometimes uh, all of those, uh, all of those colors can uh, be a bit intimidating, but again, you use the color wheel and you really can uh, can handle them. So, mm -hmm. so I would say uh, uh, large uh, two thirds of my uh, my tubes of paint that are laying around are probably earth tones, mm -hmm. and another third are various blues or grays. So, it sounds wonderful. Other questions? See, they're already tired of me. <laughs> Not that. No, I, I think you've answered everything so thoroughly. 
Oh, we have another one in the chat um, saying your the painting behind you is beautiful, which I don't think we, if we, if you lean to the side, Mike, we can all, another one of Mike's paintings is behind him. Um, and this one was asking, uh, talk to us about that painting, particularly how you paint your skies. Skies are, are a really good excuse to stay an abstract painter. You know, you can do a lot of things that are satisfying in abstract art in skies. And I also uh, find skies quite uh, uh, fascinating because they change all the time. And so there's nothing really right or wrong in a sky. You just, uh, you paint it. But I'm not, not wild about just painting a blue sky. Um, I think uh, Pizarro was the guy that said, uh, there's nothing so boring as a quiet summer day at noon. And uh, so, you know, I don't, I like, I like a little action going on there. And so it gives me an excuse to, to really uh, work with brushwork and, um, and uh, forms that are not necessarily relatable to, uh, uh, to reality, but they, they please me. So that's what I do. So that answer the question or I go off somewhere else. <laughs> no, I think that was great. And your skies are one of my favorite parts of your paintings. Well, thank you. Another question, do you paint with music? Do you have anything going on in the background while you paint? Absolutely. I could not paint without music, I don't think. It could be Bach, it could be the Beatles, it could be uh, uh, 1960s folk music. It depends on my mood. Uh, but I find that uh, very soothing. You know, painting is kind of an intellectual uh, pursuit in a lot of ways and you use a lot of brain cells up, a lot of energy doing this stuff and that kind of keeps it all flowing for me now other people have other ideas obviously but but uh, i i must have some music and coffee i gotta have some coffee too <laughs> <laughs> well that's just a good time right there yeah it is you're right other questions i have a question for you mike if you don't mind not at all sure. I know you said that earlier on that you're not a plein air painter uh, and that uh, you are, your paintings are oftentimes amalgamations. Uh, do you use any photography? Or are you relying solely on your memory of, be, of these experiences in the natural environment? Well, kind of a combination of the two. Uh, I often will take photographs of things that interest me, but they don't actually appear as as a photograph in the painting. It's more like I like, uh, if I'm looking at a fall tree, I might like the way the light's leaking through the tree and that's what intrigues me about it. So, um, so there's that, but I also spent uh, many years of my life traveling the state and uh, all that stuff kind of gets imprinted here. And so I would guess in any painting, I've, I've done plein air painting, but I'm not, I'm not very good at it, very honest. And uh, what I'm good at is, um, is in the studio making the adjustments that I need to make. I'm not really an a la prima painter. In other words, I don't just put one stroke down and that's it. I don't have that kind of talent. What, what I like to do is think it all through and I make changes. You know, the nice thing about painting is you always paint over or scrape it off if it's not working for you. So, um, and I, so I like the studio atmosphere better than I do like plain air. But, uh, uh, but largely, I think it's probably imprinted on my head. But, you know, I'll go down the Wapsie or somewhere like that or up by Nancy's house and I'll look down a valley and it's, it's all that stuff, you know, it's all that stuff. And so that's, what, that's kind of what I paint. Sometimes it actually has a lot to do with the uh, atmosphere that I'm trying to create. And the titles of the painting actually are quite important to me. So uh, those are usually the clues to where I'm going with the painting, it's that title, so. That answer your question, Sean. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> no, no, that was perfect. That's just what, that's what I suspected, but it's great to have that confirmation. Thanks. Another question in the chat wondering, do you paint quickly? Depends, I, I guess. on Some paintings just flow. 
Mm-hmm. I'm playing, I see Bob Eccles there. I painted a painting for them years ago that just flowed. It just like one in the afternoon it was done. Everything I could have done to it, I did. And uh, uh, then other paintings, uh, you fight them, you fight them for years. Uh, some paintings will take four or five years to paint. And uh, you're kind of constantly evaluating, constantly looking at it. And in my case, I think about it a lot. Uh, and uh, so uh, you can, uh, I guess the easiest way to say, you, you fight them till they quit. <laughs> when they quit, they're done. <laughs> That's excellent. Other questions? Do you have a favorite work of your own, Mike? Yeah, I do. Actually, one of the my favorite paintings is a it's one that's in the show, but we didn't use it today. is called mm-hmm. High Jingo, and that uh, painting is a painting that really has a lot to do with walking up through Beaver Park. Some of you people will know about that in the fall with those mighty oaks kind of shading you, and then. At the end of the line, or at the end of the path, is a magnificent maple tree, which I'm actually not sure any of those trees exist anymore over there. Mm-hmm. But uh, high jingo is a uh, a jazz term from uh, from the 1950s, I think. And uh, there's a guy named Art Pepper. As a matter of fact, he was a jazz saxophonist who had an album in 1960 called High Jingo. And it was explained to me by one of my uh, uh, people I know who actually play jazz. The high jingo is uh, that moment when one of the people in the group is so exceeding everything else that was going on. Everybody else is kind of quiets down and they're just saying, got high jingo, baby. And that's, and that's what I saw that tree as. That, that tree and that, that situation was definitely high jingo. It had taken over the whole, the whole visual. So that was that's one of my favorite paintings. That is an amazing painting. That's in the show. Mm-hmm. And that's in the show. So it is. Yeah. It's kind of centered on one of the walls in true high jingo fashion. And in true high jingo fashion. Great. We have a, a curator that understands this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm lucky enough to work with artists that are good at explaining it. <laughs> Well, I, all I can say is thanks a lot for everybody that joined us today. This Jeez. has been wonderful. Yeah. It it's wonderful. Yeah. Thanks very much. Lovely to see everyone. And Mike, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Absolutely. My pleasure. Have a great Sunday, guys. Thanks a lot. You too. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>